Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, thanks for joining us here for a fireside chat with the uh, President and COO of Gilead, um, John Milligan. Uh, we, um, you know, this is the 15th anniversary of the Bio CEO Conference, and I went back into the archive and looked at what Gilead's market cap was 15 years ago. Anyone want to guess? <laughs> Anyone out there? 1.5 billion is the number. And uh, that means Gilead has gone up, on, based on today's market cap, 40-fold over the last um, 15 years. And so my question to start off, fireside yeah. chat, is um, what's it going to take for Gilead to go up 40-fold again over the next 15 years? <laughs> well, I assume we're going to have to have a lot more revenue. <laughs> yeah. it's, and, a, it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge for that. But uh, all jokes aside, um, if we could start off maybe big picture, and t if uh, John, you can talk a little bit about the biotech industry. Um, obviously, it, we've we've come a long way. You're one of the your company is one of the leaders mm -hmm. in the industry. Um, is this the beginning of a next uh, you know number of years of growth, or on the negative side, is biotech just evolving into a, you know more like Big Pharma at this point? Well, I don't think biotech's becoming more like Big Pharma. I mean, is across the industry. You know, I sort of see two different trends right now. One is there is a remarkable amount of productivity in small companies. And I think that's a result of many things coming together, including all the work that was done over a decade ago in the genomics area to try to understand genes and now pathways. And you can see that the biology is catching up to the the chemistry, so we understand the pathways and the chemists can now attack them and come up with some very interesting compounds and come up with very interesting biological um, molecules. So I see a revolution in science where the productivity is very, very high in the industry right now. Uh, I also see at the same time there is less funding than there's ever been for these mm -hmm. ideas. So I, it's kind of a strange dichotomy to me that we have these two things going on. I think as uh, we're going through rapid changes in healthcare and delivery of healthcare. It's an industry that's never been more important because rapid innovation occurs best in small organizations, I believe, or at least those who can act like small organizations like Gilead, so that we can try to come up with the answers that are necessary to help further healthcare delivery in America. So it's a really, really important time that we continue to fund this industry. So I wanted to uh, delve in and talk about each of the uh, franchises. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you have and, and spend, you know, maybe equal time if we could on HIV, HCV, and oncology. And, um, you know, last year, in front of this very same fire, yes. you and I talked almost exclusively about HCV. That's true. Uh, and it's driven uh, an incredible rate of return in the stock over the past year. But let's not forget how important uh, HIV is, and you happen to be, you know, launching in the middle of the launch of uh, Stribold right now. So, um, Maybe we can talk about market size a little bit. So only about 50% um, of the 1.2 million infected patients uh, are on therapy. And yet, you know, these therapies of which yours are the dominant ones have been available uh, for so long. And why is it only 50% and do you expect that number to increase, the overall market increase? Yeah, it's a good question, Joel. So why, why aren't more people on therapy? And it's really only been in the last few years that there's been an evolution in the understanding that bringing people onto therapy early is a benefit rather than a harm. Mm -hmm. So people, so we, we've, we've had several different studies now that have shown things that I think are important. One, we've shown that putting people on therapy earlier, so before their CD4 count gets too low, leads to better personal outcomes. We've seen a study called HPTN 052 in which we've shown that people who are treated um, can't transmit the virus as well. It really lowers the level of virus in the body, of course, which makes it hard to transmit. So we now understand that there's a benefit to the individual and a potential benefit to society in lowering transmission rates if we treat more people um, and treat them earlier. Uh, in addition, we've now come to an understanding that testing people is important and there should be fewer restrictions around testing. There was a, a lot of privacy concerns, of course, about HIV testing. 
Uh, now, I don't know if you've seen that there's ads on television, you can go into a pharmacy and buy an HIV test and in the privacy of your own home, figure out your status. And so these are important trends which will only increase the rate of diagnosis and of course increase uh, the rate of uh, the number of people who are on therapy. But it has taken us about a decade. You were talking about the past and I was thinking back to when we launched Shuvada and there was only about 300,000 people, which is a, a decade ago by the way. Uh, there are only about 300,000 people on treatment in the United States, and today there's about 650,000 people on treatment. So we've roughly doubled that number in a decade, and I think we can do better than that in the coming decade as well. And along those lines, the Stribold launch, can you give us an uh, update on how that launch is going and if you ex still expect uh, the European approval soon? So you know, the Stribold launch in the United States is going pretty much as we anticipated. So we're, uh, we had a very good launch of Complera uh, almost exactly a year beforehand. And so I thought that was a pretty good proxy for how we're doing. And we anticipate that Stribuild would be better than Complera based on the clinical studies done and the robustness of the results. And that's, in fact, what we've seen. So the, the prescriptions at the same point in time versus Complera, the first full quarter in the market, were 90% higher. Mm -hmm. So it's a significant jump up for, uh, over Complera uh, as we anticipated. So we're very pleased with the trajectory that we've seen uh, with, with uh, Stribuild. And, and by the way, Complera is turning out to be a pretty good drug. So I, I, mm -hmm. I'm very pleased with that launch. And yes, we're still going through the process with the EMEA. It always takes a little bit longer and seems to be lengthening, quite frankly, as things are slowing down. But we're still on track for a, a first half of this year launch of Stribuild. I shouldn't say it, EMEA approval. And then we'll go through the various pricing and reimbursement issues in every country that as we go through and launch it during the course of this year. So yeah, we're still on track. And speaking of reimbursement, what, uh, what might happen if, uh, might single tablet regimens become victims of cost constraints in countries that can get access to uh, generic tenofovir down the road? Is, what are you doing to avoid that? Well, it's a, it's a good question. There's certainly been a lot of studies that, that have uh, been undertaken and more are being undertaken now looking at single tablet regimens versus multiple components. <laughs> And we have a consistent finding that single tablet regimens lead to better outcomes and in fact can lower the cost. And they, they lower the cost by uh, keeping people out of hospitals because they take their medication more frequently. And they lower the cost because they don't become resistant as quickly. And when they become resistant, don't, don't forget, they go into more expensive regimens. And so what we see is that um, the trend is all towards single tablet regimens. And we have a couple of examples in Europe now. One was in Spain and the other was in Denmark where there were small attempts to break up single tablet regimens. And those experiments in those hospitals or in those systems largely failed. Mm -hmm. And so in each case, they went back to single tablet regimens after a short experiment because too many people were having too many problems. So the health benefits are clearly outweighing the cost containment that they could have. And I think that will, that's a trend that will continue for the future as well. So we're, we're very optimistic that the standard of care will remain. The guidelines also help out because they endorse single tablet regimens and that's very important for us as well. So you continue to innovate in HIV and uh, if you could spend a, a minute or two talking about TAF, uh, the next generation Viriad, and in particular my, my question is does it have to, once you incorporate it into a, a multi-drug regimen, does it have to be better than Stribald, for example? I think, so TAF, was formerly known as GS7340, is a very specific targeted prodrug of Viriad, and it's got very unique properties. In fact, it, uh, uh, we can use it at a, at a much lower dose, somewhere between one-tenth to one-thirtieth the dose, depending on the formulation that we have it in. Uh, and it seems to have greater antiviral activity and also lowers systemic exposure of Viriad in the blood. And so that, of course, makes it uh, safer. Mm -hmm. And in the early studies, the phase two study, we saw uh, statistically significant differences in bone parameters after only 24 weeks. And we also saw uh, evidence that there were fewer renal events. And so both of those things are, of course, of concern for long-term therapy. And don't forget, long-term in this uh, industry now means decades of therapy. So we need long-term safer medications. And so I think we can show that there will be a safety benefit over Stribald. I'm pretty confident of that uh, in, in 48 week studies. Whether we can show statistically that we have better efficacy is very difficult to do in this industry right now. We're very good at keeping people on therapy for 48 weeks. The, the groups that we work with are very 
um, good at keeping uh, patients from dropping out. And so as you approach 90%, I think that's really the upper limit of where you can end up in a 48-week trial in, a practical, in practical terms. So I don't expect it to be different on that front. Maybe over time, maybe over 96 weeks or 144 weeks, we might to see differentiation. And those are the studies that we like to do, which is to continue to monitor our studies for three years so that we understand the long-term benefits. Okay. Um, let's move on to HCV now. And um, one of the things that investors are grappling with more than anything is the size of the market. Yeah. And um, so if you think about four and a half million diagnosed patients worldwide, only 4% treated. Can you give us some insight in, as to why only 4% are treated? You know, we've, if you look at the cascade, there's a number of factors as to why people aren't treated. And a lot of people um, who are diagnosed are either early in their disease, uh, and so they're more reluctant to take an interferon-containing regimen. Let's not forget you give up your life for a year when you go on interferon, right? You have terrible side effects. You have them every week. Um, people end up having to either give up their weekends or give up their jobs for a year because you feel so bad. And so a lot of people will choose not to go on therapy. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of people who just simply are ineligible to take interferon because of other underlying diseases they have. And it's numerous things that will keep people from going on therapy. Uh, so at the end of the day, you end up with a subset of people who can come out of treatment. And then you have physicians who will only take so many patients per year because yeah. it is a lot of work to take an HCV patient, especially with the three drug combinations today, to keep them on therapy for 48 weeks. The amount of work for the nursing staff and the doctor is very, very high. And so it, there's a natural constraint at that point of uh, the point of care that's going to keep people from going through. And so if you eliminate the interferon or shorten their duration, those barriers go away. And then the so I think the natural evolution of this will be somewhat like HIV. You know, once you have safer therapies, once you have access to doctors more readily than you do today, there will be a push to diagnose more people and more people will be seeking care because obviously you want to cure your HCV before you need a liver transplant, which is very hard to get in this country, uh, and or before you get cirrhosis of the liver so or liver cancer, importantly. So there's, you know, there's a, a, a strong desire to treat more people. There just aren't the right medicines at this point in time, and there isn't the right infrastructure. And all those things can change very rapidly. So there are a lot of drugs in development right now for, uh, yes. for HCV, oral drugs. And um, some of your competitors have <clears throat> thrown out some aspirational market share numbers. And I'm wondering if you can, I guess, answer two questions. The first is, where can that 4% go as a, as a, as a market? Yeah with all the competitors out there, just round numbers. And then what kind of share um, do you think Gilead should aspire to uh, of that uh, of the overall market? Well, our, our aspiration is always all of it. <laughs> okay. So that's... Let me write that, that down. That's 100, our, that's 100%. Our I said, again, I can update my again, model. Just to be clear, I said aspiration. <laughs> Um, it, I think about it in terms of the number of patients who come into care rather than market share, because this will be a little bit of a different kind of market. So if you think about last year in the United States, we think somewhere around 70,000 people were treated for HCV. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, if you look at the, uh, that can easily double. There have been periods of time that we've treated 140,000 people per year in the United States and could potentially triple. So you can see that the capacity could open up as, uh, the, as it gets easier for the uh, hepatologist to treat and as the high um, decile HIV treaters start to take on treating HCV patients, which I, I already see happening. So there will be capacity in those things. So I, I could easily see you know, 150, 200,000 people seeking care per year. And even under, those, under that scenario, it takes quite a few years to cycle mm -hmm. 4 million Americans through. So it will take some time to get there. Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, there will be competitive regimens out there. I shouldn't say that. I think there'll be other regimens out there. As I see Gilead's regimens evolving, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to compete with us because we have, we'll have very simple single tablets. Uh, and I have to say the barrier to resistance that we have with the uh, beer or 7977 is uh, in some ways unprecedented in this area and I think will be a big differentiating point for us as we go forward. So you have described um, three waves to, with, of your drugs and combinations of your drugs to address uh, the various subtypes of HCV. Yeah. Can you um, walk through those with us and uh, a, a specific question, are you still on track 
uh, to file for approval sometime in the second quarter. So the, the first wave for us is to get sofosbuvir itself on the market. And so there will be, there are four clinical studies. As you know, three of those have been uh, announced, at least with, with regard to top line results. And the fourth study will be available uh, sometime this quarter. And so uh, those studies will allow us to file for the treatment of genotype 2 or genotype 3 with sofosbuvir and ribavirin for a course of 12 weeks, or genotypes 1, 4, 5, and 6 for 12 weeks of therapy with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. And so that gives us the opportunity to treat every genotype with one 12-week regimen uh, with a slight variation depending on if you need interferon or not. And so that will be the basis of the filing, and yes, we're on track to file that in the first half of this year. So that's going very, very well. Um, but as we know, the, the, so this, I thought it was important in particular to have the genotype 1 interferon arm because it is a, a, a revolution compared to what's going on today. 12 weeks is not, a, you, you just put people on for 12 weeks and you get very, very good outcomes. 89% of patients who have genotype 1 responded. That's unprecedented in this field with a very, very promising side effect profile. Um, but we know that there's going to be better ways to treat genotype 1 in particular coming up. And so those are the studies that we have ongoing with 7977 uh, and 5885. Uh, so these are the, 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 it's two products, one pill. We're treating it with and without ribavirin, 12 and 24 week duration in a variety of different patients. And the leading indicator that this is going to be successful really comes from some early studies in, in Electron in which we looked at both null responders and naive patients. And of the 36, I'm sorry, of the 34 patients we treated, all 34 have had SVR12. So that's very promising. So I think that will be the next wave, particularly in genotype 1, uh, and we're on track to be about a year behind so Sofosbuvir uh, with that combination. So again, moving very forward. And we have those two pivotal studies. We might add a third to it, but we have two pivotal studies uh, which are now uh, enrolling. Or, uh, so one is enrolled in a Vanguard and one is enrolling. So it's really, we're, we're moving very, very quickly with the next wave of innovation. It seems to me that uh, everything's gone your way since the acquisition, well, with one exception that we won't talk about that kind of happened around this time last year. <laughs> exactly a year ago, yeah. yeah. But uh, what, should, what do you worry about? Is there anything to trip up the very aggressive um, timeline that you've set forth on Sofosbuvir? So, so far, we've treated about 2,000 people so far. So we've had varying durations up to 24 weeks. We've looked at very severely ill patients. In fact, we're looking at, currently looking at both pre- and post-transplantation patients. Mm -hmm. And so that speaks to the confidence that we have and, of course, the confidence the regulators have that this is a safe enough therapy that you can go into people with very severely compromised livers uh, and treat them to see if we can affect uh, how the liver transplant goes. This is really, I think, actually a very important data set that we'll have uh, to look at whether you can prevent the reinfection of a new graft in somebody. Because mm -hmm. if you have liver, uh, if you have HCV and you have a liver transplant, 100% of the time you get reinfected, even after the old liver comes out. Uh, and so if we can prevent that for a number of people, that's a big change in the outcome for those patients. And their prognosis with their new liver is much, much better, of course. So this is an important data set for us. But I think it gets back to your point. This, this tells us that the, you know, both the regulators, uh, the doctors, and of course we view this as a very, very safe drug in a wide variety of patients. Likewise, with 5885, we have well over 1,000 patients treated now. So our confidence in the safety of these two drugs together is very, very high. So I don't see much that can go wrong in this area. It's the next generation compounds where we know less about where things can yeah. still go wrong. And those are the pangenotypic molecules that we're working on today. How about the fact that AbbVie will uh, effectively, they're a little bit ahead of you. So could they you know, take some patients away that you might not be well, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know their timeline specifically. I know that we will be very, very close behind. Yeah. You know, we'll, we're doing, in a, of course, you can imagine, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we can accelerate that. Yeah, I think if, they, you know, if you launch a drug, people will use it. There's no yeah. question about it. When there's a better alternative, people switch pretty quickly. Right, right. Um, I want to ask about the HCV sales force. You really haven't said much in the past, wondering if you can share with us any insight at all as to um, uh, what it will look like, and if not, when you will share that with the street? Well, it's, it's fair to say, you know, this is, there aren't a lot of secrets in this industry. I don't know if this is a competitive secret to, 
to not say anything about it. Uh, some people think so. Uh, you know, I think for a disease like HCV, we do, we do need a dedicated sales force. We haven't determined exactly how large it will be. It could be as few as 100. It could be as many as 150, somewhere in there. I don't know. Um, uh, I think um, this is a product which will be fairly well known and have good recognition. So I think we could probably err on the smaller side and be OK with it. Um, I think what we do well as a company is medical education. And I would put a little bit more emphasis on our medical scientists and uh, who go out and, and talk more on a peer-to-peer -peer level with doctors and are able to respond uh, to the sophisticated questions that you would get in these difficult diseases. And I think that's where we'll do a particularly good job with, uh, with this disease. And we'll put a little bit more emphasis on that. So it's not a huge effort, but there are a lot of things that we have to put in place to make sure that we can cover um, all the doctors that we need to. You know, we currently have a hepatitis B sales force, and I, you know, I think we'll, as part of that, we'll probably lower the size of that sales force uh, and take some of those people and dedicate them to HCV. So they'll be, you know, whenever you have a change in your business, it's a good chance to disrupt something, and I think we'll do that. Okay, we have about five or six minutes left. I want to switch over to Hemonc, which is a key area for you guys now. And my most important question is, um, how many more names do you have in the works for Adelalisib? <laughs> Adelalisib? I can't even say it right. Uh, can you say that again? Adelalisib. Adelalisib. Yeah. It rolls right off the tongue. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. I like 101 better. So, so, the, so the answer is one. <laughs> be a, we'll have a trade name for it at some point, and that will be the last name that we'll have for it. Yeah, we tried to keep it as simple to go from 101 to 1101, but yeah. of course then you have to have a generic name, and that's, you know, that's out of our hands in terms of what it's called. Right now, the drug has a duration of response of over a year, which is, is really impressive. There are other impressive drugs yeah. in, there, uh, in there, too. Um, any thought as to how long that duration can go? And well, that's what we're trying to test right now. I mean, we've, we've had some open label studies. Um, some of these have been at a wide range of doses uh, of up to three years with patients on 1101. So that bodes pretty well for the long term benefit. Um, the longest, really, um, study of a single set of doses is the uh, indolent NHL study where we've had people on uh, for quite a long time now. And we're coming up to the point where sometime over the course of the midpoint of this year, we'll probably get to sort of the median time on therapy and we can make a guesstimate about what this is going to look like. But we've been very pleased with how well tolerated it is. Uh, I think with the exception of some uh, liver elevations, which you do see with this drug, uh, it's been very well tolerated in patients. So I think it has the the kind of profile that suggests it could be useful as monotherapy and it could be useful in combination therapy for the future. And that's something we're very interested in embarking upon. Uh, we recently have talked about a sick inhibitor that we have uh, that's also a twice daily drug. Both these are twice daily. And we looked at some early studies of synergy and see quite a bit of synergy between the two. And in fact, have just opened up an NDA to study those two in combination. So it's very exciting for us. So uh, it looks like you're also in the lead here in CLL. Um, and I'm wondering what the next indication will be. Could you, might, might you be in the lead in indolent NHL as well? If you, uh, well, indolent NHL, there's a, a long a shot factory. that we, yeah, if yeah. you think about it, if there's a real long shot that we could get on the market based on the phase two data. Yeah. It's gonna depend on the robustness of that data set. So how many patients actually responded and for how long do they respond? And that's not something that we know right now. At least I don't know it, somebody might. Um, it also depend on what's going on in other companies and behind the scenes. So it's the kind of thing you have in a conversation with the FDA and you get a feel for whether these data would be sufficient or whether we'd have to go into bigger phase three studies. Uh, and at any rate, we'd start those studies so that we could accelerate the, get an accelerated approval. So I, I think there's a chance we could end up in the lead there, but there's also a chance we could uh, be forced to do the bigger phase three studies before we'd allow to seek approval. So it's a little bit hard to know. You know, Joel, these are, these are really competitive areas yeah. right now. You say you're in the lead in CLL. I know there's a session on CLL coming up. Right. There's a lot of different companies coming at it from a lot of different angles. So it'll be very interesting to see how it evolves and how it's carved up at the end of the day. Well, thanks for the commercial for the next talk. Yeah, which, um, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, I'm interested in that too, and uh, we will be talking about uh, yeah. those drugs. Yeah. I wanted. We only have a couple minutes left. I did want to make sure that if anyone has a question, they uh, can feel free to come up to the microphone and ask it. Now would be a good time to do that. Um, and as uh, I do have a couple final questions, and you did, recently did an acquisition, um, YM. Yes. 
can you talk about the thinking behind that acquisition? Yeah, so um, we've been putting together a whole series of different components that I think will be useful uh, in combination in various different B cell disorders and, uh, and other uh, blood cancers. And we felt that having a JAK1-2 inhibitor would be a nice piece to add to, to the, the portfolio that we're developing right now. In addition, on its own, it looked like it might have differentiating features where, uh, versus Jacophy, uh, which is a very good product that's come out from Insight. And so we felt that there was a good chance that this could be competitive, if not better than Jacophy, and we would be willing to try to run you know, a very important controlled head-to-head -head study to see if it was better. Um, that on its own would certainly make it a worthwhile thing for us to have and help us accelerate into this area. Uh, but also we're very interested in trying in a combination of various other kinase inhibitors and antibodies that we have currently, including 6624, which is in the clinic for myelofibrosis now. So as we've rounded out this portfolio, it's, uh, we went out looking for uh, this kind of molecule and it seemed to us YM had the best one and that's why we uh, chose to do this, this transaction. And I'm very pleased that we were able to close that last week and uh, now we can bring the compound in and accelerate it. Yeah. Last call for questions here. Um, final 30 seconds, I would ask, is there anything that investors are missing on Gilead or any favorite uh, uh, pet projects you have going on you want to share with us that you find particular? Well, there's a lot of really interesting, uh, you know, we are becoming a biologics company. I, yep. I mentioned 6624, our first antibody. So what I'm seeing at Gilead right now is very interesting. It's a real uh, explosion in productivity. We're seeing great molecules coming through on our HCV portfolio. I think I've seen some of the best things that'll probably never be drugs come out because I think the field is moving that fast that uh, uh, we won't need them. Um, I've seen great productivity in our, uh, our all the kinase biology. So, you know, it's, it's a really productive group right now. We're seeing good progress in a number of areas, and I, I hope that we can expand beyond where we are into some of the really important diseases like fibrotic diseases. Uh, where I think we could make big inroads into some diseases that could uh, affect more and more of the aging population, and that's where we're putting a lot of our effort. Out of time. Thank you very much, John. All right. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate it.